So hello everyone, Charles Banfield here again today with another Karate Canucks conversation. And, and today I'm very pleased to be joined by Sensei Brad Jones. Uh, Sensei Jones commenced his martial arts journey in 1969 at the age of 14. And seven years later, he was running his own dojo, which is uh, still in operation today. Uh, a longtime top student of Osensei Masumai Soroka, who, as we all know, is the father of Canadian karate, uh, Sensei Jones has made several international journeys to learn from other renowned masters, including Osensei Dr. Siyoshi Chitose, who's the founder of Chito Ryu Karate and um, the first teacher of uh, Osensei Soroka. And uh, another uh, renowned one is uh, Sensei Masatoshi Nakayama, who's a student of Osensei Gichin Funakoshi, who's the father of modern karate, and also um, Sensei Nakayama is the co-founder and former chief instructor of the JKA, the uh, Japan Karate Association. Sensei Jones uh, has enjoyed a successful competitive career throughout the 1980s, uh, representing Ontario at the National Black Belt Championships for nine consecutive years, uh, winning three gold and two silver medals in the process. And he's also represented Canada at various international competitions, including the Pan Am Championships in Caracas, Venezuela, the Japan versus Canada tournament, which took place in Toronto, uh, the USA versus Canada tournament uh, that took place in San Francisco and California, and the World Karate Championships in Cairo, Egypt. And all of these took place in 1983. So that was, that was definitely a busy year for, uh, for Sensei Jones. Um, in 1990, he retired from competition and focused his efforts on teaching and coaching, serving as a co-coach for Team Ontario for several years and as a head coach for the Canadian national karate team from 94 to 1999. In 2002, Sensei Jones received his level four coaching certification through the natural, the national coaching certification program and subsequent, subsequently became the karate course conductor for that program. Uh, he's also a, a director of self-defense programs with various school boards in Southern Ontario and a former president of the Ontario Karate Federation. Sensei Jones is also a nine-time recipient of the prestigious uh, Ontario Sport Achievement Award, which is presented by the Government of Ontario. And other honors include, uh, but uh, it's not an ex exhaustive list, but they include uh, being inducted into the World Martial Arts Hall of Fame in 1996 and the Canadian Black Belt Hall of Fame in 2019. And aside from being a high-ranking karateka and coach, um, he is also an accomplished musician, musician and the author of a book titled uh, Detour on the Path, which is uh, an autobi autobiographical account of how lessons learned through his martial arts training helped him cope with some extreme personal hardships. So with that said, uh, welcome Sensei Jones. Uh, it's a pleasure to speak with you today. My pleasure as well. That's quite a list. <laughs> I know. Uh, it. No. <laughs> well, 50 plus years, I guess, in, in the game, you're going to have a, a few a few things to read off. And, and I could have gone on, I'm sure. But th this was, um, I wanted to try and keep it as, as uh, concise as possible. So, Thank you for the yes. <laughs> so yeah, so the, the way these things go typically is um, they all start the same. Um, and then it takes a, a natural, more organic course as we go through the conversation. So uh, where I'd like to start is um, it's just some general background about you. You know, where did you grow up uh, and what prompted you to start your martial arts journey? Well, uh, I'm a small town guy. I was born and raised here. In fact, my family goes back to the 1700s in this area as Quakers. Um, after the American Revolution, they got kicked out and uh, ended up moving north, um, Keel Street and Aurora Side Road, and they had their homestead. And our family just stayed in this area all that time. And uh, yeah, so being raised, this was a very small town when I was young. And uh, most of the so time- this, this up, being, sorry, this being uh, Newmarket, is it Newmarket, Ontario? Newmarket, Newmarket, yeah. Ontario. Okay. And, and in those days, Toronto was a long ways away. <laughs> um, so yeah, I was kind of born and raised around here. Uh, um, my parents wanted to keep me active. They put me in hockey and baseball, and uh, I had very little interest in that. 
I remember one time as a boy watching a ball go over my head thinking, oh, I guess I'm supposed to catch that. <laughs> so it just didn't jive. And I remember seeing a, um, a demonstration on a TV program of a karate class one time. And I thought, oh, what is that? And um, it just caught my interest. <clears throat> and then I was searching to try and find out uh, what I could find. There was, a, there was one book on karate that was sold in Cole's bookstores <clears throat> back in the 60s. Um, I even forget the name, but I did see a copy of it years later and he had all these strange positions and I'd be in the basement trying to mimic the movements. And didn't know what the heck was going on. And then one day a fellow, uh, or I saw a sign on a, on a telephone pole, karate classes. So I took the thing home and I said to my dad, Hey dad, I want to, I want to do this karate thing. He says, ah, what do you want to do that crap for? You're going to wreck your hands. You won't be able to play guitar anymore. <laughs> so I signed up anyway against my family's will and got involved. And uh, within about a year of uh, beginning training, uh, came to the realization that this was going to be my life. And uh, I actually consider myself quite fortunate um, to have found a path so early in life because it did um, it give me, gave me drive through everything I did to lead to a certain place. And I, I find a lot of younger people, especially uh, that are kind of lost uh, about a direction or at least a direction and they float about here and there. So it was a, it was a realization quite young in, in uh, life. <clears throat> so 14, 15 years old, I decided this is it. This is what I'm going to do. Of course, when I tried to tell my parents that they looked at me like I had three heads. <clears throat> so, <laughs> I don't think there's anyone other than Sensei Soroka who was making a living at, at martial arts. Because I remember years later after training and I t had a conversation with Sensei Soroka. Who, and I said, Sensei, this is what I want to do. I want to be a full-time instructor. And the only thing he said about that was, well, just be prepared to be poor your whole life. <laughs> and I said, oh, okay. <laughs> and I was okay with that. <laughs> and of course... You know, I learned through other uh, means and other studies. There was a group called NAPMA for a long time that started up in the 90s. Uh, it was National Association of Professional Martial Artists. And uh, I became part of that. In fact, in fact I became a, uh, a liaison for them in Canada, uh, mentoring schools. And it was all about business practices and um, becoming a, a better instructor, learning about ADHD, uh, learning about things that I didn't know because I realized uh, I was I was pretty good at my karate but I didn't know anything about business so I made every mistake possible wasted more money on bad ideas and if you do it enough times you tend to get a few things right as Brian Tracy says 80% uh, of the decisions you'll ever make in your life will be wrong so if you only make 10 and 8 were wrong you may, may not make a lot after that if you make yeah. 100 decisions and 20 are right well, you may be onto something. I think the most successful people um, understand that. Yeah. yeah anyway, uh, yeah, that was very, uh, very helpful in the earlier years. So, so you started in in '69, and um, so this would have been a, a karate club that had opened in in uh, Newmarket. Was it a, a private dojo, or was it like through the town, or how? how who, who, it was, off, who was offering the program, I guess, is where I'm going with this. Yeah, it was a private thing. They, uh, they rented the... Uh, in fact, it's just up the street from where I am right now. I'm on the main street of Newmarket, and I purchased this building, which is uh, the original Roxy Movie Theater. So oh, uh, it's wow. premier school. It's 9,000 square feet, two dojos, gym. Um, of course, one of my goals was always to create the training facility, I wish I could have trained at myself. <laughs> um, so it was up the top of the hill where there was a fire hall. I think upstairs was an, a banquet hall, and that's where it started. So this fellow, I guess, just rented the space from the town, and he put up flyers on telephone poles and got a few people signed up. And, of course, that is the 60s. There was no children. There was no women. Um, and I was the, one of the youngest guys, and there was a bunch of really hard-ass guys in there just beating on one another there was no kata it was just sparring <laughs> it was pretty crazy um but it, that was a different time um, you know after the 80s when kids got involved and so on 
things shifted considerably. But back then, it was pretty crazy. Yeah, yeah. And 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 who who was the first? Who who were your first instructors? Then I you met you know oh. mentioned in the introduction uh, Sensei Soroka, but but right. So was... that fellow's name was Earl Hughes, and he was affiliated with a Gojiru group uh, that I believe Don Warner was the head of uh, back in the day. And that ran for a few years. And then I believe Earl Hughes moved out west. He just left. So I was kind of left on my own. And back then uh, I was too young to drive. So there was a club in Richmond Hill that I believe was run by a student of Sensei Hagashi. Um, it was on Bayview, uh, just south of uh, Aaron Mills, uh, mm -hmm. in the bottom of a plaza. So I would hitchhike down there a couple times a week and hitchhike back as... Of course, my uh, father wouldn't drive me. <laughs> and then that finally closed down. And then I had the hitchhike to a place down uh, near York University. It was called the Samurai uh, Club. Uh, I don't even know what the background of that place was, but it was a dojo and it was the closest one I could find. And I went there for a while. And then uh, eventually a club opened up here in uh, Newmarket under the town recreation department. And they had hired the fellow, the instructor who was a student of Sensei Soroka. His name was Umberto Marasco, um, short, stocky fella um, who taught and brought me to Black Belt. And that's where I was introduced to Sensei Soroka, was through him. And uh, then when I was able to drive, I would go and train with uh, Sensei Soroka a couple times a week and then train in Newmarket a couple times a week. And then, of course, uh, uh, after I received my showdown, uh, Umberto kind of said, nah, this is too far for me to drive all the time. You take over the club. And at the time, I was an apprentice electrician. So I, I mm. took up the trade back then. So I thought, okay. So I took it over. I was 21 and been running it ever since and took it from a town rec program to you know, one of the premier dojos in the country. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I would I would concur with that. I, I've been to your, to your uh, dojo once. I, I attended a, um, a seminar, I guess, that was hosted... At your facility, but it was a, it was a fundraiser for the, I think it was the Yellow Door. Oh, that was last February. Yeah, it was yeah. A, just before COVID hit, and yes. uh, yeah, it was I was it was really impressive. Yeah, the facility you had there was was really impressive, and uh, and uh, obviously the the number of people that were gathered there as well was uh, was great. Also, it was probably a couple hundred people in in the place. So oh yeah, it was great, and it's it's, it's big enough to house. No, well, a couple of hundred. We have we have our Kagami Baraki here, and three hundred people here. Um, yeah, well, yeah. Great facility. Uh, I'm really quite pleased with it. I have to pinch myself once in a while. Been a hard, lot of hard work to get here. However, it's here, and uh, that was another thing. The way I designed this, so I'd spent considerable time in Japan, and I would look at different dojos, and I even picked up a book on Japanese architecture, and. Uh, as, as I mentioned earlier, I wanted to, to um, provide, well, I wanted to become the teacher I wish I, I had and train in the facility I wish I could have trained at. So designing the, the layout of the place, I, I'd been in places that were impressive that they were a gym that happened to have a martial arts program. So it was very obvious it was a gym first. Yeah. I wanted this to be a dojo that happened to have a gym in it. And there was no mistaking when you walk in, this is a dojo. Yeah, uh, the decorated the way it's laid out. The, you walk on stone when you come in, then you walk on wood. Uh, and the idea was, when you come in here, I want you to Im immerse yourself into a different world. When you come and you bow, the uh, the um, the decorations on the wall, the color, everything uh, is to uh, to reduce a distraction, so you can just focus on your train. I even have a kamidana at, in both dojos. So the, for those who don't know, coming down, if you go into any dojo in Japan, uh, I don't use the word shrine, but you would have this little house. Uh, mm -hmm. I use every word but shrine because I don't want to confuse people and think this is a religious thing. Yeah. But I have that in front of the dojo. And uh, when I explain to students who start here, when I have an orientation class, I explain that when you walk into the dojo and you bow, you pay respect and see that thing on the wall up there. And those doors are open on the kamidana. And we believe that those doors being open is a connection between the world of the living and whatever you consider an afterworld. So that the, 
The spirit of those who have passed on, if they want to watch us, that's where they watch from. So when you come in, you're paying respect to the founders of what we do. And uh, they're okay with that. We don't put any religious thing on that. Right. But yeah. it's part of the feel. It's part of the look and uh, things that I've collected over the years uh, from traveling to Japan. They're all up there. Uh, one day, a portion of my ashes will be there too. <laughs> In fact, pretty much okay. every... Every instructor that I've had that have passed on, or even some friends, I have something of them that sits up there somewhere, mostly hidden. Yeah. So it's uh, paying respect to even some people I knew. And even during COVID, uh, I've been, of course, many of us have been doing Zoom classes. So I've had <laughs> to make it clear to a lot of the students that it's important that you tune into to uh, watch the Zoom class because it's in the dojo and I have the camera facing the front of the dojo and i've explained to them i'll bet you if the senseis that have passed on were watching this and seeing us training even though they wouldn't understand this technology but they would see you on the screen and realize that during this really difficult time you're still dedicated to your training and you should be very proud of yourself for that so i've I had to instill that in them a few times uh, but just to remind them that uh, uh, if we didn't have this technology, we wouldn't have the dojo running at all. And uh, so it's work. Um, it's so, work. yeah. So uh, I'm curious about, um, you meant, well, I mentioned, I guess, in, in the intro that, um, you know, you, you had trained under, under um, Osensei Soroka. Yeah. And you'd also done some traveling to train. And yeah. can, can, can you maybe fill us in on some details as to, you know, again, your experience training with Soroka Sensei, and also how you made your way to Japan and, and other places, um, and whether O Sensei Soroka had a had a hand in that. Oh yeah, he did for sure. Um, so uh, I guess it was 1978, the first time I went over. So I told Sensei that I, I wanted to do the trip to Japan, and uh, he kind of set it up for me. And my original plan was to go for two years. And uh, that didn't quite work out. I ended up spending four, four and a half months the first time when I went over. So uh, Sensei Soroka had arranged for me to go and stay with Chitosi Sensei. And some other students back then had made the same trip. You mentioned Peter Giffen earlier, and he had gone there. I think he had, was there before me. I mean, he may have gone a couple of times as well. So the only time I went to see Sensei Chitosi was the first time in 78 where I went and stayed there for a couple of months. And um, I shared a room with his son, Yasuhiro. And the, the dojo was in the backyard. And it was great. I was, it was surreal, actually. Because uh, his daughter also played the koto. And uh, so I'd be training sometimes outside, and his daughter would be playing the koto upstairs, and I could see rice fields in the distance. thinking, wow, it's like living some uh, movie. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, but what I had discovered... Uh, when I went the first time is that the karate I was practicing with Sensei Chitosi was quite different from what I had been doing with Sensei Soroka. So I had came to some serious realizations on that first trip. Uh, so what had happened over the years, Sensei Soroka, of course, uh, started teaching the first dojo. The first person to ever teach in Canada was a guy named Ari Anastasius. Yep. Uh, but never started a dojo. Uh, so Sensei Soroka is credited as having the first dojo in Canada. And coming over after training under Chitosi and, and doing Chito Ryu, uh, he was getting visited often by uh, different instructors from Japan, often from the JKA. And Shotokan, um, their organ the JKA early on organized themselves in a way, well, it goes back to after World War II when the Americans sent, spent their special forces instructors to Japan to train in Judo and Aikido and Karate and realized they had to organize their teaching somehow. So they started early uh, with documenting certain things and making it uh, teachable, especially to foreigners. So, uh, and, and competitively, a lot of the Shotokan guys were very, very uh, successful in competition. They had lower stances. They had, uh, they were very explosive in their movements and it was very good for competition. So he had started to adopt some of those uh, training methodologies. So he would, he, by, even by that time, he had taken a lot of his Chito Ryukata 
and used uh, like a zenkutsu dachi instead of a sanshu dachi or and lower deeper stances so, so, so when this I get is my, this sorry this just sorry to inter interject this is chitose sensei or soroka no, sensei? soroka soroka okay okay soroka, yeah because he when he had come he had trained under Chitose, so he had the chitoryu style so yeah. he was beginning to um modify the training uh, it was a blend of uh, Shotokan and, and Chito Ryu is actually what I was learning. In fact, we even did the hand katas, but we also did the, the low high show and all the, the kata that were done in, in Chito Ryu, but with do, uh, different stances. So right. when I'm now training Japan, I realize, oh, no, it's not that it's this stance. And all this inside tension in the stances. Well, after two weeks, I could hardly walk. My muscles yeah. were not used to uh, being used that way. And the fact that we were training outdoors and the backyard was a dirt, dirt floor. So it's kind of like training on sandpaper. <laughs> so my feet were just raw. <laughs> Tender feet and muscles that, uh, you know, I'm a young guy, but still, when you're doing that much training in something you haven't done, it was a challenge. And while I was there, I mean, it was wonderful uh, living there, training there, and living with the family. And uh, there was no, there wasn't a knife and fork in the house. You had to do everything with chopsticks, like fried eggs that are half cooked. Try to pick them. <laughs> it was crazy, but it was great. Yeah, I really enjoyed it. Um, his son-in-law uh, spoke some English because he had been in the United States, so it was okay that way. And I would often go with Yasuhiro to where he would teach in the countryside, and. Uh, a lot of these kids had never actually seen a foreigner uh, because uh, Kumamoto, it wasn't a touristy spot where foreigners would go. So I, it was interesting because I'd go help them teach the class and these kids would be following the class, but staring at me on the side, a, you know, making comments. Little kids would follow me around the street. In fact, at one point, this is a, kind of funny. Um, I, was, I wanted to buy a pair of Zoris, the sandals. In the, in the city of Kumamoto. Well, we went around to some shoe stores and people generally in the south of Japan are a little smaller than other places in Japan. And I'm six foot three, I'm, you know, 200 and whatever pounds. And uh, so we couldn't find him in a shoe store. So we had to get on to the, the um, telephone to phone some different places and um, order them in. So it was interesting because it, uh, it was Chitoshi said to, or or his wife would be on the phone to a shoe store and they're blabbing away. I don't know what the heck they're saying in Japanese. Uh, Yonju go 45. So that my foot size in European size is 45. So it was interesting because that number I recognize it. Yonju go. And then all of a sudden everyone would burst into laughter <laughs> because they never even heard of a foot that big. <laughs> so anyway, they ended up getting me a pair of sandals from Tokyo and I got them. It was fine. But I, I was an oddity. I, I, almost had a callus on my forehead from going on uh, through doorways because the average, I, I have a photograph of myself standing in front of Chitosi's home, uh, purposely standing there and the door is right about my cheek level. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, so it was very, it was a lot of fun. It was, it was a great cultural experience living there. And while I was training there, I met a young fellow from that area who was visiting home and he was going to uh, Kyoto University. And he was the captain of their karate team at Kyoto University. So he says, well, when you're traveling toward Tokyo, stop and train with us for a few days. So, okay. So when I finally left Chitosi Sensei and uh, was traveling to Tokyo, because uh, I had a letter of introduction from Sensei Soroka for the JKA for when I got there. So in between, I thought, well, I'll stop with these fellows and uh, train. So I stopped, I meet the guy and so I show up for training the first day, and these guys are university students, and they're crazy. The training in university is just crazy. That's all they do, five hours a day. So I said, I, I would like to see some of uh, Kyoto. I said, okay, come training. We'll go do some sightseeing. I said, okay, sure. I, I show up in my gi. We're training. I, I think we did kumite for a couple of hours. And they would take a piece of foam rubber and shove it down inside their gi and put on a couple of knuckle pads. And they pretty, it wasn't full contact, but it was, we were smacking each other pretty good. And the little foam rubber, a bit of protection. And they said, okay, we're going to go jogging now. So we jogged through the whole freaking city of Kyoto, barefoot. The old, it's, 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 it
uh, my feet are ripped to shreds. <laughs> I go home, come back the next day. I think we did four hours of kumite. And I, like after a couple of days of this, I said, okay, I got to go. <laughs> I'll never survive. When I'm sitting with these guys, I'm looking at their feet. They were so thick with callus. When they bent their toe, there was a split like a, like a cavern between their toe and foot. It was so thick yeah. in this uh, kind of training. And to walk around completely barefoot all over the city. Yeah. So that was an interesting experience. And then after that, I ended up traveling to Tokyo. And that's where I found the uh, Hombu Dojo. And um, I, I came in with a letter of introduction. And they looked at me and they grabbed some guy and they took me up the street. And I said, okay, you can sleep here. And I ended up staying at uh, what's called the Hoitsugan. So the Hoitsugan is Nakayama Sensei's Dojo. Um, Nakayama Sensei lived in an uh, apartment building uh, where Kanazawa also lives, in the same building. And uh, there was two levels of basement. So the first level of basement, so uh, the ground level was about chest height. They had just put up some uh, partitions and threw a mattress on the floor, and you could stay there. And it was real, relatively cheap. But, but you had to train every morning downstairs with Nakayama Sensei. So he would teach two to uh, usually three times a week, and then another guy, Kagawa, would teach a couple times a week. I think it was 7.30 in the morning was that class. Yeah. Uh, There's no heat in there. There was cockroaches so big you could hear them walk. Uh, but it was cheap, and I didn't have a lot of money. And um, so I stayed there uh, until I ended up coming home a few months later. And um, that's where I got to meet the... Uh, Nakayama Sensei, and that was, and then of course at the JK. And when I got to the JK headquarters, it was a scary place. Then, oh my god! Uh, I remember um, meeting these guys that were from all over the world. Um, this was kind of the mecca for Shotokan back then, and these guys were from every country in the world, and a lot of Arab countries. Some pretty hard cases there, and uh, <clears throat> I met a few guys, and we went for coffee. So, oh god, watch out for this one! Watch out for that one! Whoa! Watch over your heart, Sensei. You piss him off, he'll put you in the hospital. And like the stories were just scaring the crap out of me. <clears throat> Yahara tried to throw a guy out of the second floor window one day because he got a roundhouse kick and slapped him in the face and he got mad. And he, like <laughs> literally tried to throw him out the window. <laughs> there were scratch marks on the wall. <laughs> uh, so all these warnings and so on and so on. And um, but one one story uh, that uh, I'll never forget because uh, I have a lot of respect. For, I mean, all of the people I've trained under, but as an organization, I, I, I kind of modeled my dojo after what I, what I saw at the JKA. Uh, I realized that in, in the world of business, period, you have uh, systems driven businesses and you have personality driven businesses. So you have the mom and pop restaurant that you go to when then mom and pop aren't there there's no business because they have the recipe and you go because they make the food then you go to the keg and it doesn't matter who's in the kitchen they're following a menu and you're going to get the same thing over and over it's consistent so i mean both are fine but one's going to live longer than the other and many dojos are run like personality driven businesses mm -hmm. in fact i realized that early on knowing that i was going to make a career out of this at that I need to affiliate myself with a solid organization or a, a, um, uh, what do you say? So I can control uh, quality control in a sense. Um, so that I, when somebody has to fail a test, you're not the bad guy kind of thing. So yeah. seeing the way they ran their dojo and you would show up at the, at the JK headquarters and every day you had a different instructor. And all those instructors are the guys that are in those best karate books, you see, because those were printed in the 70s. Yeah. And you had uh, Tanaka Sensei, who was at the time, I believe, a four-time world champion. Osaka Sensei, who was a kata champion. Then you had Asai Sensei, who was this freak of nature um, that spent a few decades in Taiwan learning um, Chinese martial arts, and he blended it. So all of them had their own way of doing things, but all of them were in their prime between late 30s and late 40s. And man, they were kicking some major ass. It was a scary place to be. Um, and the young apprentice, apprentices, or the Kenshusei, uh, they were getting, I mean, 
back then, the typical karate guy there looked like a hockey player here in the uh, 70s. No teeth. No teeth, all yeah. Up, you know, all smashed up. And, uh, that's That was the norm. Uh, so, but one day, I just want to tell this one first. Uh, th- I was training with Nakayama Sensei in the morning. And it was a small class. There's sometimes only six of us. Uh, a couple of Japanese guys, a guy from Australia, there's me. Um, and we're down there, and uh, this guy shows up from Fighting Arts Magazine. And uh, that's, uh, I think that's Terry O'Neill's magazine. It ran for a long time. Very, very high quality martial arts magazine. Uh, back then, they were interviewing true masters and so on, and the articles were very good. So this guy was there from the magazine doing this article. So I'm just on the sideline listening to him. Uh, and he's asking Nakayama Sensei these questions. He says, oh, what have you done? Have you done this? You've done that. And during the interview, he, uh, he says, oh, you must know this fellow in England. He's a fourth down in this and a sixth down in that. And a he just went on this long list of uh, his stand rankings. And Nakayama Sensei was just what, listening politely. And then at the end, he says, so do you know this, uh, this, this fellow? Nakayama says, no, I don't know him, but he must be very, very good. He says, me? I only practiced one time my whole life. I'm still not very good. <laughs> I thought, okay. And I was, I, he wasn't talking to an audience. He was talking to one person. I just happened to hear that. I thought, okay. There's something about, and the, also with, the, with that organization, the thing, things that I admire about them, that, that's one. Their, their, their humility. Nobody's wearing a red belt or a red and white belt. They just wear an old tattered belt. Nobody calls anybody a Shihan or a Kokshi or they don't use any of these terms. It's just sensei. And you just know when they walk in the room because they have an aura. When Tanaka sensei walks into a room, in fact, I stood outside the dojo one day. Uh, it used to be in an old bowling alley uh, from Ebisu Station. You walk up the street. And then you walked up outside the building and there's a little platform for you go, before you go in and you could sort of see up the street. And I remember getting there early one day and I thought, oh, it's too early to go in. It's a sunny day. I'm just going to stay out here for a minute. And I'm just looking up the street. And I'm noticing people parting. And I look, Sensei uh, Tanaka is walking up the street and people even walking the same direction as him are just moving as he walks down the street. Like he was parting people by his aura. And I don't know if he, anyone even noticed or realized it was happening, but if I hadn't seen it for myself, I wouldn't have believed. He just had, I mean, he was a, he had a presence. Dude. Yeah. yeah, there was a presence there and it was uh, uh, unmistakable. But a lot of these experiences, I was very, I consider myself very fortunate to be there around that time to train with some of those people at that time. Yeah. So yeah. really like, late seventies to the end of the eighties where they were really at their peak in terms of producing what they produced. Mm-hmm. And of course it changes in time, but it was also a very dangerous place to be very dangerous place to be. Um, it was on my, on my second trip over there. Um, it was two years later. So I went home and went back to work and saved on whenever I went, I didn't have to work. Uh, teaching English or something, I saved enough money to live on, uh, being frugal. So the second time I went, I used uh, I was working at the Havilland Aircraft as an electrician at the time, and I got a leave of absence to go uh, for another four months. So I was working a lot of overtime, and I wasn't in the top condition I could have been in because I was working extra hours and I couldn't train as much as I wanted. So anyway, I, I show up in Japan. I went this time. I went directly back to the JK headquarters because I realized. So this is more what I've been doing, and it suits me better um, in terms of my body type and so on. And uh, so I I went directly there again. And uh, I was going into the dojo. I was carrying a few extra pounds, too. So I'm training and training, and every day I'm getting my ass kicked up and down the floor. I can't move fast enough. I just just, These guys are flying at me like bullets. And these guys are much smaller than me, too. But, man, they're fast. I was really getting discouraged. So like a month and a half in, I'm all beat up. I'm, one day it's cold out. I'm in the, I went to the public bathhouse um, uh, and I'm doing some laundry. I was doing, sorry. Yeah. The laundry was next to the bathhouse. So, I, so I'm sitting doing my laundry. I happen to be writing a letter home. 
back then you actually wrote letters. <laughs> remember those days? <laughs> yeah, I do remember those days. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I'm writing this letter home and I'm writing things like, Oh my God, I'm over my head. What am I doing? What am I thinking? Blah, blah, blah. I'm, I can't do this. And um, so later that day is when I went to the bathhouse to warm up because it was November or something. There's no heat in the Hoitzka uh, Dojo. So, you, you know, you go to the shower and you, uh, this is the only place you can warm up, get in that hot tub. So I'm sitting, I put the sh I'm in the bathhouse, I put my shampoo on the, on the shelf and you sit on a little stool. It's about, you know, two or three feet high and you're sitting on a little edge. You wash down before you get in the tub. Well, I'd taken some shampoo, put on my hand, I put my hands up and I could see in the mirror in front of me, my arms. And I didn't actually look at my arms. You, when you hurt every year, cut above the eye. I think I had a broken toe. My nose was smashed. Like I'm just hurt everywhere. I'm bruised. Every time you put your arm down, it's like, ow. And I, you just hurt everywhere. So I'm looking at my arms. I think, holy crap. They're just all black and blue. So I'm touching it like this. And then I punched it. It was the same sensation. Like I've been kicked so many times and not out of the way fast enough and taking shins on the arms that there's probably nerve damage going on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I had a moment. You asked know, about epiphany and excuse my French, but, and you may edit this out. I had a fuck this moment. <laughs> <laughs> enough is enough. <laughs> Here I am trying to get out of the way from these guys. And I, what is my advantage? I got size and I got reach. So I had a complete attitude shift in that moment. Yeah. I walked in the dojo the next day with this, we're done with this. And from that moment on, they started coming flying in. I just tucked my arm straight out. They impaled themselves on the end of my hand. Now my problem. So I got me. That's what happens. And you, ha I realized to survive in that. And this wasn't even the instructor class. This is regular class. But being a foreigner there, it's like you got a target on you all the time. You know, I, I've experienced racism the other way. <laughs> yep. You can call it, uh, you can call it whatever you want. But you're a foreigner, you got a target on you. And if they could knock down a big white guy, they just love it. <clears throat> so I got mean and I started hammering them back. And then after a while, they started backing off. And then after a while that I'd walk by and they'd start whispering with each other. like, Ooh. And then, so I carved my line in the sand and stood it, stood the ground and uh, started getting some respect. And then mm -hmm. the training went on from there. And uh, however, when I came home from these trips, most of my dojo disappeared for a couple of months because controlled sparring there was if you can cut the guy above the eye or punch and cut, split the lip, that's control. <laughs> Knocking their teeth out is too much yeah. or smashing them so hard and breaking their orbital socket. That's too much. Yeah. You can but loosen you the practice, teeth, but not break them. Right. That's, break. that's kind of the line. Yeah. <laughs> my uh, my uh, friend that was living over there for a long time, he went a little crazy. He had a, an album full of photographs of his injuries. And he'd, like, he'd be cut above the eye where you can see the bone. He's got a picture of that. He's got a cut. He used to talk through the cut under his lip. Like, hey, hello, how are you? Like he, he went a little off the deep end, this guy. Yeah. He'd been beat so much that I personally, I thought, you can stay here too long. Um, in fact, I met a couple of people who went there and stayed too long because. Um, the the uh, First Nations people here have a term that I found appropriate to use there. The term uh, is when when the uh, First Nations people they're they're following well what they would call the white ways or Christian ways. Halfway between that and halfway between native ways, they call it lost in the woods. They're in neither place. Yeah. So when you go when you would go there um, back in those days. Uh, a lot of people were drawn by the mystique of uh, Japan and uh, Japan was a hot topic for a few, a couple of decades. They would stay too long and the best they could do is get a job teaching English. And uh, so if they stayed there too long, they went go, go back home and all the friends they had, they're gone, they're dead, moved on. So they, they didn't fit in there anymore either. So they didn't fit in properly anywhere. Mm -hmm. And I considered them lost in the woods as well. And a couple of guys, they're in their 50s now, and they're trying to do They can hardly move anymore. And they have a teaching English job. And I thought, okay, I'm not going to be one of those. So I realized you have to go there for a short time, get what you get, come home, and get your sanity back. So I realized when my students disappeared, because I came back 
when you were used to having a, 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 a target on you, you just get used to moving like that. And I'd be sparring with my own students and smacking them a little bit. So one poor guy. Oh my God. I, when I thought about it later, I had him up against the wall and just like, was bah, 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 and then, really, Oh shit. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so I had to calm down. It took a couple of months to kind of calm, calm down a little bit. Yeah. And then they were all back. <laughs> had to acclimatize so, and so on. So exactly. Yeah. Yeah. But I do remember back because we would be training at minimum twice a day. Uh, sometimes three times a day for five days a week. And it was intense training. Like it was an hour class, but you had to have a, five, a couple of minute break in the middle. So it was, it was pretty intense. And that was the best shape of my life. I felt like I remember jumping over a hedge. I was going down the sidewalk with my girlfriend and this hedge was up to by my hip. I just bound over it like a deer. And I realized, wow, I just did that. That was cool. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Wow. So, so that, that kind of conditioning obviously is, is great if you're, you know, a younger, a younger person yeah. and uh, it's Absolutely. not sustainable in, you know, into your late thirties, forties, fifties, sixties, whichever. Right. So um, I'm curious about how, how, you know, your approach to training and teaching has evolved over, you know, your 50 plus year career in, in, in karate. Well, I kind of consider myself a bridge from the uh, old school method to what we would call a more educated approach. Because I believe there's still uh, a time and a place for everything. Mm -hmm. I'll pull a Shania once in a while, but instead of smacking them in the back of the leg, like Soroka Sensei used to beat us with our regular base, I'll smash it against the wall and scare the crap out of the kids. But it motivates them. <clears throat> so yeah. I'm not doing that every day. However, they need to understand this is a dojo. This is martial arts training. This is a picnic. Uh, but after going through um, organizations like uh, NAPMA that I mentioned earlier, uh, when they would hold a convention, they'd have 2,000 people show up at their peak uh, from different backgrounds, and they would have different classes going on at the same time, like a summit where you'd go and take a class, and this was all about learning about ADHD kids. How do you teach them? This one was about uh, first aid. This one was about psychology uh, and so on. So going through the NCCP um, level four program was one of the best things because we got into the science of, of training. You're training a high-performance athlete or is this a, a club level person? And, and, and in terms of intensity of training, um, how, how it relates to time. High intensity, short time, short time, or shorter time, uh, longer time, more uh, less intensity. When is it technical? When is it conditioning? So uh, graduating that really, um, really did help. So we, the, we train a lot smarter nowadays, of course, and we can we can get better results in a shorter time by not like you don't go to the dojo every day and do a thousand kicks over and over. We realize at a certain point, your body fatigues to a point where you're sending a message from your brain to your muscles because you're so fatigued, you can't even raise your knee that high and you're actually detraining. So yeah. it's all about when do we do it slow? When do, we, when do we do it for strength? When do we do it for speed? And how do we do it for speed? And so on and so on and so on. So uh, it's changed so much. And in fact, I have a lesson plan that I developed over many years we follow that's been very successful. <clears throat> and at the intermediate level, it's more about training drills. So I look at it as a novice level student, you're learning about tools. This is a hammer, this is a saw, this is a chisel. Now you're a green belt and above. Now this is how you use a saw. And this is how you use a chisel and this is, a, and so on. So it's, we kind of look at it long-term that way. And then of course, strategy comes later. Okay, now you, you know how to use this chisel and hammer. Now, when do you use that chisel and hammer? <clears throat> There's strategy. Yeah. So when you look at it this way, it's uh, like I say, we get, we get better results now than we ever did than just punishing someone over and over where, you know, I, I believe a lot of us that are still around, we are just too stupid to quit. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually that that's a good segue into my next question. I was going <laughs> to ask you uh, what's kept you involved over the years. And, you know, I, I don't think it's stupidity obviously, but uh, just, just curious as to what, what, you know, was the driving force, you know? If, if well, there's a singular force. Well, I was uh, 
raised by uh, my parents. My father uh, came from a family uh, where his father died just around the time he was born. There was 13 kids. So being raised during the Depression uh, at 13 years old, okay, time to go. Like you're kicked out of the house. You're on your own. Mm -hmm. He had to go live, uh, work on the Great Lakes ships. Uh, he only got a grade five education and was a truck driver his whole life. So we're, what motivation, like he, he, there was no help there in turn. My mother, simple lady, wonderful woman, uh, worked as a bank teller her whole life. So my family upbringing didn't instill anything in me that would have um, pushed me to do what I do. But the people that I met through karate, and I'll say that over and over, if it weren't for karate, I don't know where I'd be. Um, the the Sensei Soroka was one. He, he became like a father to me. I would mm -hmm. often show up at the dojo early. We'd sit in his office and talk for, you know, an hour, even before class. And, and the things and the people I met through him, originally uh, Stan Schmidt from South Africa, the, the senseis from Japan, the, all these people that I saw that were successful in what they did, <clears throat> which led me to meet other people who were successful. And this whole uh, thing that we learn in martial arts about discipline, I wasn't taught that anywhere else, that endeavor. I mean, we say that every class, part of the dojo kun, that one of them is endeavor, never give up. So, when this is instilled in you and you come across challenges, quitting is not an option. Once you instill that in somebody, it doesn't matter what they take up. I've been, my not upbringing everyone. outside of my family has produced the way I am. And, uh, and I'm very proud of the when I'm, when it's all said and done, I'm proud that I have led other people in that sort of direction over thousands of students that have come through this dojo over the years. Many have become very successful and many of them are now friends. Uh, that are police officers or uh, they've, whatever they've taken up, what was instilled in them is this discipline, this never give up attitude. And they, that's what you learn in the dojo, those tough lessons. There's very few places nowadays that, well, we're all aware that uh, this movement of kids show up for a, a sports event and everybody gets a medal. Yeah. What the hell is that? <laughs> Honest <laughs> to God, we're rewarding mediocrity. And that's everywhere. The school system, the, you, I mean, it just goes on. And I, I don't want to go down that path. But as long as I'm still running a dojo, if you're not good enough to pass a test, you're not passing. <laughs> so they're taught how to deal with failure. Yeah. And honestly, if you don't learn how to deal with failure, you're going to be crushed one day at a, at a less appropriate time. So we need to instill this in our younger generation so that they're resilient when they're older. Because you don't want to be 35 with a family and, and get fired from your job and fall apart or commit suicide or whatever because you, you don't have the, the intestinal fortitude to deal with failure. So these are the, I, I believe, these are more va Kicking and punching, great. We live in a safe country. When we leave our door, we're not worried about being jumped. I'm not saying it's impossible. We're, we don't live in South Africa. We don't live in Brazil. We don't live in other countries where that's a real threat. When you walk, when you leave your home, that's a real threat. So you do have a different motivation when you come to the dojo. I'm in a town of Newmarket where kids, privileged kids come in that, how do you instill in them this intensity that you want for them to achieve the levels we're trying to give them? Uh, I don't know how, other than like pressure, put pressure on it, make them work, attack them for real. Like, I spend more of my time trying to convince the person attacking the other one to do it for real. Stop dancing around. Get in there. Like, I, I've gone out of the traditional, you know, you, you do a, a training, a sparring drill where you would step back and tell them, Jodo Tsugi. And they pause and say, oh, like an Ipong Kumite thing. So I took that mm -hmm. out and said, step back and say, I'm going to tear your face off. <laughs> the other day, bring it on. <laughs> and then go. And I'll tell you, you watch a class go from a level here to off the rails because now they can relate to what they're saying even though they're role playing the intensity just yeah and that's how you, you learn ways to to bring this up because the threat of being attacked when they leave is not there we have to make the threat in the dojo more real <laughs> but you have to fear the guy you're training with more to bring that level up yeah. sorry I'm, I'm going down a bit of a tangent but uh uh, I find that more valuable. 
uh, yeah. then, you know, let's prepare them for life. Yeah, it's like, it's like the old adage, you know, it's better to, how's it go, perspire and practice than bleed in battle or something like that. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> kind of one of those those types of things, yeah. So a question, a question I like to try and ask as many people as I can is, is uh, about, you know, the epiphanies they've had throughout their, you know, throughout their martial arts careers and so on. Uh, you, you've alluded to one before when you were in Japan, you know, you had this, you know, F this moment kind of thing, which I don't know if it would be a eureka moment, but maybe I guess it was for you. It's a very personal thing, but uh, um, I like to couch the question in a sense where it's, you know, is it, um, uh, or would you, can you share, you know, a bit about, you know, if you have them proudest moments, uh, you know, as in, in your martial arts career or, or best achievements or, um, or most prominent realizations, most, pro most prominent Eureka moments that, um, that, you know, have helped shape your, your journey and, and maybe the journeys of some of your students. Yeah. I guess the thing when, you, when people are doing what they do, uh, no matter what that is, whether we run a dojo or if they're a musician or performing, what, it's like a steady stream of things. So often we don't stop and think about it because we're always moving forward and not looking backward very much. But when you give, uh, give us some thought, in, from my earliest times, uh, I think the, the idea of um, nothing is impossible. So when, you're, when you start training, and the thing that appealed to me, I suppose, about martial arts training, as opposed to other activities, was you're always encouraged to do more than you think you can do. And if you're mm -hmm. coached properly, then you hit those. And then I had those when I was younger, like you're just doing like, sit-ups. Okay, I, oh, I can't do 25. And then one day you do 25. It's like, oh, I can do, or a push-out, or whatever that might be. So those are the, probably the earliest ones. And then you, over, uh, when you have enough of those, like passing a belt, um, wow, I passed that. And then you look back, oh, that was easy. But now, so this is just constant uh, challenges that lie ahead. <clears throat> so there was lots of those little ones. Um, the one I mentioned, that was, that was an attitude shift that uh, when you realize that um, you're capable of that, you fold that up in a nice little box and you put it away, but you know it's there if you need it. Yeah. Yeah. So, Give yourself permission to bring it out when it's, right. when it's appropriate. Yeah. But you know, it's there. Yeah. Uh, I would say in terms of proudest moments was uh, walking into uh, the world championships behind the Canadian flag and uh, competing for my country mm. and, and realizing very few people have that honor. I was going to say privilege, but it's not a privilege because you earn the honor of walking into uh, whatever, whatever the stadium is or whatever the event behind your flag, uh, which made me a very proud Canadian. And uh, there, there were lots and lots of smaller ones. And that's one of the, one of the, or that is the reason I became an instructor. Again, I explained my background was nothing glamorous, but what I, what I got compared to anyone else in my family, and even my extended family, the places I've traveled, the experiences I've had, I wanted others to experience those thrills or the honor of walking in. So um, that, oh, well, the second one, I guess, would have been uh, walking into the stadium for the Pan Am Games in, in um, Winnipeg in 1999 as the national coach with the Canadian team with 54,000 people in the stands cheering, waving Canadian flags. Yeah. Wow. That must That's, have been a rush, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Uh, amazing. I mean, we, there was another moment where um, when they opened Sky Dome, um, I was involved with Karate Ontario back then, and I was sort of, uh, I guess, volunteered to organize or, and chore choreograph a martial arts scene for... They had two scenes when they did the opening ceremonies. They had a tribute to sport and a tribute to multiculturalism so we were part of the second part and uh so there's a group of martial artists we all met for six months to rehearse in a warehouse out in mississauga for the opening and then we did this routine all together again like sixty thousand people in the stands and here we are and we're all part of this it's, wow <laughs> this, is, this is phenomenal uh, where now i get the 
the joy of bringing a student to a point where they make a national team. And we've been to Japan a couple of times. I've brought some of my students to compete at our JKA World Championships. And I've had many of my students on the provincial team in the past, and they've uh, won medals. Some have actually done better than me in, in terms of their record. And that's, that's, you know, like a parent, I suppose. You know, you're proud of your, your offspring's mm -hmm. achievements. And there's, there's so many, too, too many to, to pick one. Yeah, those are those are great moments. What does what does a showdown mean to you? And I sort of couch it in the you know is should there be a minimum age to become uh, to achieve the showdown rank? And again, if I could add another layer on this, because uh, you know others have kind of given some insights on uh, um, on this. You know, you you've had the the um, uh, the honor uh, of uh, of uh, training in both you know North America and and elsewhere, um, but in Japan as well. And I'm curious as to your your take on the attitude around Shodan. Actually, that's a great because I, I do have a few things to say about that. Okay, great. <laughs> I remember I've lost students because uh, back in the day, since Soroka wouldn't grade anybody below a certain age, and a lot of these. Uh, limitations, so I'll call them, were put on before the days when children were involved. Mm -hmm. So you were you were a teenager before you even started, because uh, nobody was teaching kids classes. Kids classes didn't start until the '80s when the Karate Kid movie came out, and there was a wave across North America of people phoning up for their kid to take up a karate lesson. No, and everybody was phoning each other. I don't know what do you do with kids? What do you do with kids? And was like, this whole thing evolved. <laughs> <laughs> and now you've got kids, I, I even take them at five years old. So mm -hmm. at five, if they start learning the foundation, and because they were doing this in Japan. So I learned, I, I, I've wrestled with this thing for years. What does a showdown mean? Because we make a bigger deal out of what a showdown is here in North America than they do in Japan. Showdowns are everywhere. They're little kids. So when I really look at the definition, this is JK's definition of showdown. What it says, simply this, you have mastered the basics. Nida, you can apply the basics. So this is how I interpret this. So you start when you're five years old, when you're 12, you've been at this a while, you've probably got some good skills. Mm -hmm. If you can do the movements and you're sharp, you've got focus, you've got all the ingredients to say we've mastered these movements, you can be a showdown. However, you cannot do your nidan until you're 18. Because now you have the physical skills, uh, skills combined with physical maturity to make it effective on pretty much anybody. And for me, once I realized that, I, I, I have no problem. I don't care what age you are. The youngest I've ever graded was a 12-year-old to the showdown. But he started when he was five. And he was also a gymnast. The guy was incredible. Yeah, yeah. So, we're routinely passing 14, 15 year olds for showdown, but then they wait till they're 18 before they even think about it. And they're just, they're just still in the class. We're still pushing them around and that their, their skill level was, uh, was good enough that they could, uh, they could pass it. So when I saw, and when I was in Japan, I saw little kids all over the place, showdowns and they're, they're good. But you know, if you pick them up with one arm, shake them around, you know, but that wasn't the point. And we, what we get confused with here is maybe we make too much of a big deal of that. Because back in the day, it's, it's like jujitsu, uh, Brazilian jujitsu is now. If you're a blue belt, you're really good. But they don't have Dan levels. They just have black belt. That's it. There's no level past that. Somewhere along the line, they screwed up and they came up with all these Dan levels. <laughs> Which... If, uh, if I could go back in history, I'd convince whoever did that. So maybe that's not a good idea. I mean, like you're a showdown, you're just a showdown. And throughout the whole training, they're taught, to, okay, when you pass your showdown, what does showdown mean? It doesn't mean black belt. Kudobi is black belt. Showdown means first step. First level, first step, yeah. You're in the door. <laughs> now let's work with that. Now things get interesting. So yeah. if it's presented this way, if you present it as, this is the big deal, and, and I do a huge... Prom uh, graduation ceremony too it is a big deal um, when i came up with this idea i wanted to make a black belt graduation as significant as a university graduation or birth of a child or a 
so very significant. We have a whole banquet hall. It's a, there's a full dinner, a dance. I have these arches that I built that you walk down this corridor and I have this big spiel that I talk about. Uh, it's combining uh, the First Nations tradition with uh, some Asian tradition and, and made we make it a Canadian tradition because of the, uh, the uh, multiculturalism we have in our country. So it's quite, quite an ordeal. And parents come, they get their diploma given to them. And they, yeah, so they're acknowledged as part of the fraternity now. Part of, now you're one of us. Get to hang your name. Well, but the, the class right after they pass their test is initiation. We basically beat the crap out of them. <laughs> <laughs> we don't hurt them. The gauntlet where you smack them with the belt and stuff? Or? No, we just do like 10 minutes straight kumite of changing partners every 30 seconds. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And I put a bucket on the side. If you got a puke, puke in there, don't puke on my floor. <laughs> so <laughs> at the end of it all, we put their belt on them. We give them their name tag. They hang it on the wall. Okay. So now you line up here. <laughs> yeah. Oh. So, 10 well, minutes. You're, you're, you're generous. You're only giving them 10 minutes, right? <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's intense. 10 minutes. Even 20 that's minutes the, and two buckets. That's the uh, end of a class that we've been training like hell for. Uh, but, and the point of that whole class too, is we all train hard together. Mm -hmm. we put them in the middle and say okay first match go <laughs> second match go while everybody else is on the sideline encourage them come on get up yeah you can go go i mean some of them are in tears at the end of it it's intense oh yeah for sure yeah, yeah. And, and that's true and that is exhausting too so yeah and that is sort of a, a rite of passage in a sense because in our culture particularly for uh young men we don't have a, pa a like today you're a boy tomorrow you're a man we don't have anything like that. Um, and I'm like, I don't know how women uh, operate on that level, but uh, the young males in our society are, are falling behind uh, severely. I don't know if you've noticed, uh, there's books written on uh, the failure of uh, younger males. Uh, so anyway, it is kind of a rite of passage, male or female, you experience it the same way. And uh, now you're in, so. So you've kind of merged the two, you know, like the, the yeah. attitude around it being the first level, but you also make it into a it's yes ceremony. Yeah. Yeah. You were, you were a Q belt. Now you're a Dan level. So, you know, there's certain things only a Dan level person can go to. Uh, another question um, regarding style. So you've been, in, you've trained Shotokan, you, you know, basically your entirety, you know, even yeah. with Soroka Sensei, you were doing a kind of a blend of Chitoryu and Shotokan, but primarily right. Shotokan. And you've obviously been exposed to other styles. Um, in your opinion, do you think styles are relevant outside the dojo? Does it does it really matter what style of karate you 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 practice, or what style of martial art? It doesn't have to be just karate. It depends on what you're doing it for. If you are doing it for fitness and health, completely irrelevant. Mm -hmm. You want to be a cop, a soldier, a security guy. I even say, take up Krav Maga, a little bit of that, some grappling, some of this. Like I, would, I wouldn't say an MMA approach. It's always good to have a foundation in something. Because, uh, and I'm, I'm the first to say, if you learn, get your showdown in Shotokan Karate. And then go do some other stuff because you've got a reasonable foundation there. And it's not fancy. It's straightforward. Yeah. You've got good balance, posture, and all those sort of things. Um, a few of my students over the years have gone to MMA. And they were young. And I, and I didn't discourage them. I just said, okay, go do that for a while. Then you can come back and do this for the rest of your life. <laughs> You're not going to hurt your body as much. Um, I don't know. Um, a punch is a punch, a kick is. I remember hearing this once at a seminar. I think it was Patrick McCarthy, even too. He, he says, Okay, I'm going to put a blindfold on you. I'm going to get a Shotokan guy to punch you. Then I'm going to get a Gojuru guy to punch you. Then I'm going to get a on and on and on. And you tell me which one is which. Bottom line a kick is a kick, a punch is a punch. Ultimately, the styles are in somebody's interpretation of the same thing. I mean, where, where did karate come from? Did it come from Chinese martial arts? Where did that come from? Did that come from uh, um, Pathlima, uh, Athlima, uh, Pancreation Athlima, rather, from Alexander the Great? Uh, like, they, you go back further and further, 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 did, you know, the Savat, French foot fighting, 
Uh, the Japanese took a couple of their techniques. Roundhouse kick came from that. I mean, uh, it's it's a mix. So yeah. uh, really, it's the person, and uh, I'm not. It truly is the person, regardless of the style. What do you want it for? Is it for self defense? So I've been in some pretty uh, serious situations, and I can't say still. I used to work as a when I was a, an apprentice electrician. I worked as a bouncer on the side. And uh, had some pretty uh, exciting encounters. Uh, yep. Did I use a style technique, or did I have good balance and good reflexes and good uh, posture and and a good body awareness and be able to the awareness that I developed through my training it wasn't the technique that got me out of the situation. It was all the other things which all of the martial arts have anyway. So I'm so so past this. Well, we do it this way, and we do it all good. Why? Give me the reason for it. Um, uh, the days are gone when my style is better than your style. <sighs> Just when you understand it on a deeper level, you say, oh, we do this because of that, and you do that because of that. Oh, so you just do it, you know, the different paths to the same place. That's all it is. I mean, corny as it sounds, you got the the uh, judo mountain over there, the karate mountain over there, you can get that, that in different styles. So, so you, it's a tough climb to the, to the top. But from the top of each mountain, you all look at the moon the same way. Like, yeah. It doesn't matter. It really doesn't matter. So it's the time you put into it, uh, the intensity you use. And if you have to put it into practice, it's going to evolve into something very personal anyway. Well, yeah, I don't know if that answered it question oh no it did no it's it's great insight so no i i i guess um part of where i'm coming from is that you know some some styles are positioning themselves as being kind of gentler on the body you know it's something that you can do well into your senior years and so on whereas other ones you end up needing new body parts by the time you hit you know your late 50s and 60s and so on so that's true. A lot of uh, people I know that have done uh, years and years of Taekwondo getting hip replacements in their late 40s. Mm. And I've seen a lot of people here in styles that, I don't know what to call them, open style training where they learn something somewhere, and, but they didn't, didn't understand the biomechanics. And this is another thing I studied while I was in Japan. I don't mean studying in a book. I, I was always looking at how did these old guys train? They hit the makiwara every day. And okay, well, why isn't that hurting them? Well, because of the way they build it, they don't hit it that hard. They do it over time. And when they kick, they don't straighten out their knee. They pull the knee, the foot back before the knee actually extends. And a lot of the ways they do the, the training and they put their body position before they do it prevents them from wearing out the joint. So they're throwing a, a, a front kick and locking your knee at the end of it and then pulling it back over time. Uh, mini trauma after mini trauma is going to wear that thing down and you're going to have a knee replacement. So I can say after 51 years, I've had an x-ray of my hips and my knees. They're just fine. I have my knee scopes, but that was from other stuff. And they're fine because we were taught how to do the technique correctly. Right. Pull the, don't let the joints take the load, let the muscles take the load. So if you're not taught that, in fact, when uh, fitness kickboxing came out, remember uh, Tai Bo? Tai Bo, yeah. Came across really nice. <laughs> I've been teaching kickboxing, that type of kickboxing here for decades. Uh, and I'm always telling people, take up a class like that in a martial arts school, not in a gym where somebody took a weekend course. Because the knees being blown out left and right. Because yeah. they turn them out to do a round kick, but not how to pivot on the other foot. And then you got the lower part of the leg here and the upper part turning against it. What do you think is going to happen? So that was a big issue for a long time. So teaching the technique correctly is important. And regards of style, a roundhouse kick is a roundhouse kick no matter what style you are. Whether it be Taekwondo, some pull it back more than others, but it's the same thing. If you're in a Thai boxer or Taekwondo or karate guy, it's the same kick. Just change the uniform. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> or change the name of it sometimes, yeah. yeah. It's all the same yeah. thing. Use a ball of the foot, use the instep, well, whatever. The same body mechanics. So, anyhow. Yeah. So uh, in, in the intro, um, we alluded to the book that you had written. Right. And, uh, and you know, the, the theme throughout, which I've read, by the way, I think I got the, I think I was able to find the last possible or the last available 
a uh, copy of it on Amazon. So uh, um, uh, it, it's, it's a, it's a very good read. Um, lots of detail in there. I was uh, impressed with the level of detail in the recanting of, of some of the, uh, some of the stories throughout. And, um, but the theme of it was how you kind of drew on your martial arts training, you know, the physical, the, the mental, spiritual, everything to help get you through, um, you know, some, some tough times. So I was going to ask you, um, not necessarily about that experience, but, you know, what would you say the martial arts has given you? It's given me everything. It's given, it's everything. Given, given me my health. Uh, I'll say my intelligence because it's led me to places where I've learned from so many people <coughs> and experiences. Um, it's taught me a good work ethic. Um, and I would say it was good. If, if it weren't for martial arts, I would not be sitting here having this conversation. I don't know where I would be um, in life. Uh, it has given me everything. <clears throat> and, and it saved my life. Actually saved my life. Uh, so I don't mind touching on that if we have time. On, uh, sure, yeah. Yeah, of course. The, for those who may not be aware, the book that I wrote is called Detour on the Path. And it's a story of something that happened to me in the late eight, uh, 1983, 84, where, um, so I had competed at the world championships um, that year. Uh, when I got, and, I, and I went and took time off to go and train in Japan for a few months to prepare to compete at the world championships in Egypt. <clears throat> so after all that was done and I get back, I actually got laid off my job. And I um, was not prepared for that. And I wasn't financially prepared for that. And I was like, oh boy, what, what am I going to do? I'm trying to run a dojo. I'm trying to do this, trying to do that. And a person I knew had been uh, living in the tribal area in Asia and smuggling uh, hashish oil out of the tribal area into Canada and making a living at that. And he used to tell these crazy stories and so on. And when I was telling him about all my situations, he says, hey, why don't you do a run for me? So a run meant smuggling some hash oil out of uh, Afghanistan into Canada. So I said, yes. And uh, my biggest mistake of my life, but the biggest growth in my life at the same time. So I ended up being a mule uh, for this fellow, ended up in uh, Northern Pakistan on the border of Afghanistan. And, uh, dealing with the Pashtun people with three kilos of hash oil. And I smuggled it through um, Pakistan into India, from India into France. In France, I uh, was caught. I was arrested. I was put in a prison called uh, Fleury Maragis, 5,000 prisoners, largest prison in Europe, where I spent six months of hell. Um, uh, I didn't speak the language. I was alone. No one even knew that I had left home. I had a dojo that was running at the time, uh, a girlfriend that was pregnant, and uh, it was a very, very, very difficult time. So I sat on that story. The, the people who were running my dojo did a very good job of keeping my secret and kept the dojo running for me. And I'm thankful to this day. Um, I even wrote a little uh, intro thanking them again uh, for helping me in my time of need. Um, when I truly found out who my friends were uh, through that experience. So when I finally got home after a year, I uh, started picking up the pieces again. I uh, got a job back, got the dojo running. One of the biggest realizations that I had during that experience is that, okay, I was put on this earth for a purpose. So stop screwing around and get to it. And this dojo wouldn't, uh, exist the way it does had it not been for that experience <clears throat> so i did i was i was committed already but i realized this is beyond commitment this is a, a life's dedication uh, and that took over and once i kind of got my life back together and it took a long time to crawl out of a hole i had a lot of debt over that and i sat on that story for a long long time in fact uh, I had to fight for my life a couple of times. Uh, my karate training saved my life. 
uh, in a couple of situations. And you read some of the stories. There was a mob attacking me at one point and, uh, mm -hmm. as I was trying to save someone else. I ended up with a dislocated shoulder. And uh, uh, anyway, uh, you can read the book if you want to get the whole story. But I, had re I was sitting on the story and keeping it quiet. And uh, so years later, when I was uh, kind of winding down my competitive career and getting into teaching uh, self-defense training, a good friend of mine, in fact, I was working for a while as a, as a model. Uh, and that was kind of an interesting little sidetrack for a while. But there was a girl I knew who was from Newmarket, who I met during that uh, time. Uh, she was Miss Korea Canada uh, <clears throat> just a year before. She was abducted at knife point on the street in the uh, northern part of Toronto and driven in a car up right into the, around the town of Newmarket, taken out in the countryside, raped, knifed nine times and left for dead in a snowbank. Fortunately, it was winter and she didn't bleed as much. She crawled to uh, it was a senior's home at the time, got help, got, uh, got, her, got herself put back together. And I remember feeling, good Lord, this is horrific. Like I was so angry. I just wanted like, like put me in a room with this guy for 10 minutes. That's all I ask. Um, and then I ended up talking to her. Um, in fact, we became good friends. We, we even dated for a while, but we were more, more good friends than anything else. Um, cause we shared a, a horrible experience. Um, so I realized then I need to take what I have and expose it to prevent this sort of a situation from someone else. So I took from what I had learned from my classical uh, self-defense training, my prison experience, working as a bouncer, uh, working with people from Krav Maga, from uh, other approaches on self-defense. And I, I put together a program I was running in high schools for well over 20 years. And it was intense. It was, it was a, a 10 session course. People paid a little extra for it at the school. Um, in fact, we would actually send, uh, we had to send a letter home with students to tell parents, by the way, they're going to hear foul language. They're going to hear, like, be prepared. This is the real deal. We did role plays. Mm. It, was, it was actually, it wasn't a self-defense course. It was an adrenal stress conditioning course. So we would do role plays of what would happen for real. And the final test was me and another guy, full padded suit, you start at that end, cross the mat, get that towel and get out. If you get out with the towel, you pass. Anything goes. And uh, I'm telling you, we had some amazing results. And during the time I was teaching this course, I would often go to the teachers of these programs and say, listen, I had this experience and I was locked in a prison. And I'd like to explain to some of these kids why I know some of the things I know. Like when somebody looks at you that wants to kill you, what that feels like and what you're going to see in their eyes. These are things you can't learn from a book. You can't learn from a video. This is things you learn on a cellular level when you're in that situation. And if you're not in a prison, you're on a battlefield and it's a fight for a life. That's where you would learn these things. And I wanted to pass this on somehow. And the teachers would always say, Oh no, 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 no. You can't talk about that. No, no, no. You're not going there. So it frustrated me a bit. <clears throat> that I couldn't dive a little deeper. These weren't just young high school students. These are grade 12. It was only for seniors. So they're going to go from here to university and off into the world. So I wanted to give them something a little more. So my hands were tied. So that's when I figured I, it's time to tell this story for real. So I, I wrote the book. I hired a ghost writer. The two of us worked for five years to put that book together. And I had it published. And it was being sold in chapters and other places uh, successfully for quite a while. And I've had many um, emails over the years from people who've read it that they actually got something out of it because there is a moral to the story. And I tried to tell that story as honestly as possible. It's, it's, there's no heroism in there. I, uh, I really reveal the raw emotions that I went through, the, the tears, the agony, the, all of that. It's in there. It's, it was written from the perspective of someone born in this small town and then being exposed to what I was exposed to and how I interpreted that. <clears throat> so that's why it was it was a great vehicle to bring in some of the stories of living in Japan and uh, how it was so helpful during those that time of a crisis that gave me strength to to keep going. And in fact, there's a saying in there <clears throat> that uh, it's at the front of the book. 
of course, you get influenced by Japanese culture when you're involved in what we do. And the haiku, haiku type poems are often yeah. what we would interpret as a statement or a mission statement or something. So I wrote this thing and I stuck it on the wall. And I'll tell you, I'll say first. So it's, it, was, it goes like this. The gray skies that cloud our lives are sure to clear as a dawn breaks the endless night. The realization there was that there is no such thing as an endless night. No matter what, the sun's coming up tomorrow. So even as horrible as it was, in the months I was in there, the unsure, uh, unsuredness of what was going to happen next, I had to realize this is a temporary situation. So I've had that statement <clears throat> blown up on a poster, and it's at the back of my dojo. And uh, I've, I've told my students now that I published the book why I wrote that. And now I tell them, you know, or before COVID at least, I told them, you know, I'm in a very good place. I'm married. I have a nice home. I'm comfortable. I have a great dojo and wonderful students. And uh, I want to acknowledge that because that's also temporary. And now I have to read that during COVID to remind me again that this is a temporary situation. It's not going to last forever. And we just got to hang in long enough to get through this. Just like I had to hang in when I was locked in that damn prison cell long enough to uh, go through the process and then move on with life. And um, that, so the message throughout the book at the end of it all, it, it was uh, the talk I had with Sensei Soroka. When I finally came back after all I'd been through and I, no one, Sensei Soroka didn't know where I was. I just, I was gone for a year. I walked into his office and he just looked at me and says, so where you been? So I sat down and I told him the story. And all he said to me was, you know, you're very lucky. And I just looked at him and said, what? I'm what? He says, you're very lucky. Well, what do you mean I'm very lucky? He says, well, you know, you have learned things that some people only learn on their last days when they're about to die. So use those things that you learn for the rest of your life. And it took a while for that to sink in, but then it did. So no matter, I don't want to get all philosophical, but, uh, and I'm not saying everybody needs to go through an experience like that, but we really do in our modern society. Really, and COVID has helped slow things down. What's truly important, what mm -hmm. is truly important is that our, our family, if we have our dojo still, let's, let's just keep it alive. Let's treat our students properly. Let's treat ourselves properly. Let's treat each other properly. I get sick and tired of rude, ignorant people uh, honking horns if you're two seconds too long at a stoplight. Uh, so on and so on and so on. Like, let's just freaking relax. Yeah. We're not going to live forever. <laughs> anyway. Um, so the book is out. If anybody wants a copy of it, I have a bunch. Cause I won't go into the whole situation, but the chapter screwed over my distributor <laughs> and he went broke. So I had to pull all the books and I, I want to get it back on uh, Amazon eventually. But uh, yeah, that's, that's what the detour on the path refers to. It was a big detour. Yeah. Uh, hard lessons learned, but learned well. Yeah. So um, obviously a formative uh, experience for you and, and one that, you know, guided your, partially guided the, or definitely influenced, you know, your approach to the martial arts moving forward and, and what you decided that you wanted to impart on, you know, young people and your students and so on. So yeah. I think. Actually, going back to what you're saying about style, uh, this really, because before that situation, I was a competitor. And for me, well, that was, that was a be all and end all to be a competitor, be in the rain and train for it and compete, win a medal. After that experience, I realized, oh my God, that's so menial. That's just, it's like, <laughs> I can't fight for my life. There are more important things in this world than winning a tournament. And, yeah. uh, and I, I changed course and gradually, of course. I mean, I still support those who compete, but I'm not training you to go in there and hurt somebody and win. I'm training you so you can go there. If you win, that's great. But, but to enjoy the experience, to be on the floor with the best and, and win or lose, just enjoy that. And even if you don't enjoy it, experience it and then learn from that. I mean, that's, that's really, it's not about winning. I mean, winning is great, but you don't learn much when you win. <laughs> yeah. There's no styles on the street as they, uh, as no. the same goes, yeah. Right. So, and then again, being locked up, and I, but the style of Shotokan didn't save my life. 
I saved my life with the techniques I had learned, <laughs> which I don't even remember doing a technique. Every thing is a blur. I just know that some people went flying one direction and some in a different direction. And a guy was about to stab me in the back and I avoided being stabbed, but I fell and dislocated my shoulder. I don't remember learning that technique anyway, but my mm -hmm. reflex. So style is pretty much irrelevant. <clears throat> if you have these other, other uh, tools, so you do it this way or that way. So what, when you hit them, hit them with the right part of your hand, regardless of what style it comes from, if you're going to get mm -hmm. out of the way, get out of the way. If you lean a little bit, big deal. You're not stabbed. <laughs> Anyway, that's pretty extreme, but uh, no, but it yeah. makes the point, right? It may, it definitely makes the point. Is that yeah, you know, styles are one thing, competition is one thing, real life is another thing. So, yes, uh, on, on the competition side of things, you know, there, there was a lot of um, hoopla about about karate being introduced into the Olympics. Well, for for one for one year, and then that's put on hold, and we don't know for sure if it's going to take place this year or not. Um, any, any thoughts on, you know, as a former competitor, as a coach, as a, um, lifelong practitioner and so on, where, what are your thoughts? Uh, I'm curious about your thoughts on whether you think karate in the Olympics is a good thing for the art. So when I was younger, of course, the dream of competing at the Olympics, okay, we were all dreaming of that. Mm -hmm. uh, then as a as a coach later to coach at the Olympics, well, that'd be amazing. And I actually was fortunate to be able to coach at the Pan Am games, which is an uh, Olympic sanctioned event. Yeah. The, the Olympics has 7,000 athletes. Pan Am games have 5,000 athletes, but virtually run the same thing. And that was, a, excuse me, that was a wonderful experience. Um, however, when I stand back and uh, I see what, what the Olympics uh, did to judo and what, what the Olympics did to Taekwondo, which were both pretty solid martial arts. And I've talked to uh, people who studied judo back in the 50s and 60s. And they'll all go on about the same thing. Oh, once it became a sport, they only trained to score points. And it, it ceased to be a martial art again and became a sport. So I have no issue with... So what's going to happen? In, in, uh, this is a prediction. There's room for everything. When you're young, it's good to go out and compete and test yourself. I mean, it's better than going to a bar and getting in a scrap to test yourself. <laughs> compete under a set of rules where it's safe. And if you're very skilled and become a champion, that's great. Good for you. That's a sports model. So what we need to do is make allowances for sport karate and the terms already being used, budo karate. So as long as there's a distinction, I don't have a problem with that but not enough instructors that, well, if you're a full-time instructor and that's all you're doing, you'll see that fairly clearly. If, if you're a part-time instructor, you don't have time to look at it that deeply. You go to the dojo, you do this training. And then, so are we training to score a point or are we training to break someone's jaw or we're, like, we're not clear. And so it's kind of all mashed together. That's where the issue comes in. From my perspective, we have a competitive team. They train separate from the others and they work on, Techniques that you score points with. Regular class, we're dealing with somebody who's got a hold of you and they're going to smack you in the head and you're going to stop them with this and you're going to do that. Movements out of a kata, for example. And we're not talking about scoring a point. We're talking about survival or dislocating mm -hmm. a knee joint. Or just a, There's budo. Budo was about survival on the battlefield or in life and sport. So personally, I don't have a problem with as long as they're clearly distinguished. And, uh, and when you're young, go and enjoy that. I mean, I, when I was uh, coaching uh, often with a provincial team, so you'd get a lot of younger competitors come in. And one of the things I always used to say to them, you want to think about karate training, like driving from Windsor to Montreal on the 401. And as you're driving along this long road, you come to Toronto and you see the sign for Young Street. And you turn off Young Street and you drive downtown and there's lights and there's this and that. It's really exciting. Blah, blah, blah. So go down there for a while and have some fun, get drunk, get whatever, then get back on that highway and just keep driving. So it's a point in somebody's training career where it's appropriate to do that. And then, okay, I was there. Now I'm here. What I don't like is uh, while I was coaching, I started to see this, this trend 
that these were not karateka anymore. These were athletes that had a private training, uh, strength training coach, nutritional coach. They didn't have a sensei. Yeah. They were training to go and compete, period. And then we didn't compete. They quit. That was the end of it. So I didn't get involved in uh, martial arts for competing. In fact, in all the years of running a dojo, no one has ever come to me and say, I want to join your dojo because I want to compete and win the world championships. No one. They come in because, uh, well, my kid's got ADHD or I got scared once and I don't want to be scared anymore. Or I want to get fit and lose 20 pounds or I want to do all these other things are what have people brought people in and then later it's like oh maybe i'll try a competition that's the approach i've taken with this dojo but there are dojos out there that they are specifically designed to train you for competition they're generally uh, mostly younger people like children and young young people but i've got lots of people in the 50s 60s leo Cassetto, he's 73 still excited about training he studies all the dim mac and all this and he gets in classes <laughs> warps your mind with the stuff he's got but he's still excited about that aspect there's so much more sport yeah. is very superficial in a sense you got i had a chart once i used to put up but i don't remember the exact numbers but i say sport karate you got three punches three kicks that 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 budo karate 27 weapons with your hand <laughs> the elbow that that this list this long of how you yeah. can use your body as a weapon and just to show that the difference in depth in the approach that you take. <laughs> yeah. So, so just to summarize your take on the sport karate or the Olympic karate versus regular, you know, budo or whatever is that they should be, they're complementary to each other, but they should be separate. They should be yeah. not treated as one in the same. No, not if you're going to be serious about either. If you got a class and one guy wants to be a cop or a prison guard and the other guy wants to compete in a tournament, how do you train them the both ways so they both get maximum benefit? So this is what I learned through the NCCP training as well. Is uh, We've designed our, our competition training to be lots and lots of repetition. So you're not going to go learn stuff. You're just going to go and grind it up. You can do 1,000 kicks today. You're going to do this technique 150 times. And you're gonna do so that's getting you ready for competition. Now, most people don't want to do that. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, there's, there's place for it all. Oh, then you get into the difference between JK competitions and WKF competitions. <laughs> it's a big debate with us. So we do both. Yeah. And, uh, you know, one, one's a little more leaning toward the Budo side. One's a little more to the sports side. But bottom line, point is a point, right? <laughs> yeah. It's just the rules that you got to com uh, comply with that, that are different. So A good athlete can adapt to whatever the rules are. So throughout your um, 50 plus years training martial arts and practicing and coaching and, and, and uh, teaching and, and so on, is there, are there any things that you wished you had known sooner? You, you know, that you, um, whether it's lessons learned or ways of doing a specific technique or, or, or what have you, um, is there anything that you wish you discovered you know when you discover that you wish you'd known it sooner than than you did hmm. well nothing i've ever considered because <clears throat> everything has sort of uh, evolved in a sense at a certain rate so i've had discussions with a couple of my instructors where they they believe they were cheated because if you go back a few decades some, uh, especially some Japanese instructors, they, they wouldn't show you certain things, whatever they may be, a certain technique or, or a secret technique, so to speak. Or uh, especially when it comes to this pressure point stuff, Kyushu Jitsu. Mm -hmm. have you. And then, uh, but I usually comment that I don't believe they knew anyway. <laughs> if you go back far enough, when they trained, that was right after the Second World War. The country was just demolished. And they were trying to cherry pick who knows what. Let's get together and let's uh, rebuild this whole thing. And a lot of things were lost. Uh, so many things have been altered and declawed and uh, so on through the years. So 
I don't, I don't regret, or not regret, but I don't blame them for not. What they gave us was uh, their Japanese samurai mentality. I'd never give up. That was the biggest thing. But what I've learned at a different, I can't say there is because for a lot of the things, I was riding the crest of a wave with that NAPMO organization I talked about. That was the, I remember reading their magazine. Uh, it was like a business thing about martial arts schools. And thinking, and then realizing, well, I'm pretty good at my martial arts, but I, I suck at business. I don't know what I'm doing. So I joined this thing and we rode the crest of the wave in terms of uh, better ways to promote, better ways to treat people, better ways to attract, better ways to decorate your facility and so on and so on and so on. Uh, and I was able to mentor some people that way. So that didn't come late. That came at a time when back in, I mean, part of what I was just talking about, promoting your dojo, this, he would, the guy doing a seminar, he would say, yeah, I showed up at this dojo, and there was a sign on the door that says, go away, come back, we're training. And like, go away. <laughs> How do you track somebody when you tell them to go away, we're training? To having a, a warm environment when you walk in and a comfortable environment. Uh, not a window full of trophies, but a comfortable place where somebody can speak to you uh, nicely to, you know, to show you. So learning those things early uh, were very helpful. Uh, gave me an advantage over others who still had a sign on the door saying, go away, we're training. <laughs> Call me later. Uh, yeah, it, just nothing. Because it, it would have been impossible. Nobody knew. Back in the day when Soroka Sensei was here, there was no manual to follow. Though He was just making it up as he went along. Yeah. And then a whole bunch of people started to pop up and you learn from those people. And then you... You take what they gave you, and then you learn from this person, and then you okay, that worked pretty good. Well, that well, that didn't work. Get rid of it. So, our generation, or say my generation, has had the advantage of being exposed to the old style and the new style, and we can choose where we want to sit. And um, I try to sit in the middle. I don't go for all of the more modern approaches like when it comes to failing people and tests. And a lot of places won't fail anybody. Bad for business. We got rents to pay. I yep. get that business. Uh, I don't have much to say about that. But uh, I accepted a long time ago when Sensei Soroka says, if you want to do this for a living, be prepared to be poor your whole life. So I've actually done all right. When I sell this building, I will retire comfortable. Um, we retire. You never retire from this. You just switch gears. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, we don't have to be here every day. <clears throat> but uh, and that's another thing that we we don't retire from martial arts. You just slow down a little bit or change the the way you train. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, it's not a job; it's a lifestyle. So uh, you got to be careful when you're. And I've heard people say, "Well, when when I retire from my job, I'm going to open a dojo," and I'm the first one to tell them, "No, you won't, because you'll never work so hard in your life." <laughs> <laughs> No, go join another dojo and be a teacher there. That's what you really want. <laughs> but you don't want to open one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so sp speaking of dojos and so on, what advice would you have uh, for anybody who's looking to start, you know, looking to take up a martial art or they're, or they're doing some research for maybe their children um, to put them in an activity? Um, would do you have any specific advice that you would give, you know, as to what, what these people should look for? As far as looking for a dojo for their kids or for their kids or for themselves or both, you know, in some cases, oh. like I, my personal experience was we we were looking for a place for our son. And when he was there and he decided, or we, he demonstrated a commitment to it. I, I joined as well. And uh, you know, so um, so maybe it's just for the kids, maybe it's just for, for themselves, or it could be a family uh, oriented thing, but either way, like if, if you have any, um, highlights, uh, red flags, um, advice for what to look for, um, you know, would you have anything to share? Well, yeah. And nowadays it's not as prevalent, but if you were to walk into a place and they wouldn't let you watch a class, for example, to me, that's a red flag. Yeah. Uh, if to you well if you pay five thousand dollars you get a black belt at the end of it i'd have a problem with that uh, if, when you associate what you're paying for the belt you're going to achieve 
that's a problem. <clears throat> if you join a school and they're very honest about what they're doing and they're going to be very upfront and, and answer all of your questions and not dodge questions, um, if there's a certain level of honesty, I wouldn't have a problem with that. Um, if there's a good history, but if someone's just starting out, so what is their lineage? Where did they come from? Uh, would be something to look for. Uh, a good solid base <clears throat> of um, a safe environment. Um, do they have an emergency action plan on hand? Do they have a heart, um, what do you call those things, when you start the heart up again? AEDs. Yeah. 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 Do they have one of them in there? Do, like, do they seem organized? Um, I mean, the martial arts has been riddled with, um, I guess, poor promotion, poor planning, poor, like the, the days are gone when you just, okay, have a dojo and be, I don't know what I'm going to do. Tonight. I'll wait and see who shows up. I remember learning years ago. Oh, and by the way, we're not going to tell you when you're going to do a test. We're just going to test you one day. Like this whole approach doesn't work. When you, when you have an educated person come into your facility and they understand, they've been through university, they know when they start, they know when the exam is, they know what the exam is about, and then they move to this level, this level, this level. But you walk in and say, well, yeah, you're gonna, you can start tomorrow and uh, I'm going to throw you in that class over there and you're going to We'll put you, give you a couple of privates on the side, and then you can join that. And then when you're, when I think you're ready, I'm going to promote you. And that works when you got a half a dozen students and you're doing this part time in your garage. But if they're just going to take anybody, anytime, anywhere, and and guarantee that, yeah, three months you'll get this belt, and three months you get that belt. No, I've had too many people come in here and tell me they, they tell me they know nothing about. It, but I don't think my son should have passed that test. Oh, well, what does that tell you? <laughs> you don't even know what it's about. Yeah, it was sloppy. He wasn't paying attention. It's really, you, you got to research now. And and people do. Um, when they come in, I don't know, I hear it over and over. Yes, I've been referred to your dojo by so-and-so, or, or I've heard lots of things about your dojo. So I say, yeah, come in. Um, come in, sit, watch a class. So I've got, got mine organized that you do a, an orientation class first day. So you do a three month beginner class and the whole three months is mapped out and I have the parents in there too. And I lay out, these are the expectations. This is what you're going to learn. I have some kids show some of the basic moves they're going to learn. And this is, a, if I'm talking to you, I want to see your eyes. If you are leaning on the wall, you're going to do 10 push ups. I, I, I just lay it all out. And parents, do they have a place to practice? Yes. Okay. So I want you to practice when you're not here. And, uh, you know, so on and so on. So it's a very thorough laid out program. Yeah. People that come in, it's instilled in, oh, this place is serious. They're very organized. When they do their test for their belt, they have to take a letter to the school teacher. It's within this package. That they, There's a statement and they have to agree that the student is getting satisfactory grades and is respectful and cooperative. The parents would say, uh, sign a similar statement on the same letter at the bottom, and they would agree or disagree that their child is uh, respectful and cooperative. On the other page, there's a one-week duty list. Put your clothes in the dirty hamper, do, do, do this, do that, you know, black belt respect, study. Uh, <clears throat> then they have a written test, and they bring all that in together a week before the exam. If it's one day late, sorry, you don't test. And then all of these things, if they, that letter says at school, the teacher disagrees that you're not getting satisfactory and you're not respectful. Sorry, you can't test right now. So you got three months to get yourself uh, altered to whatever has to be done. And if they change their mind about you, then we can test you because we don't teach dangerous skills to irresponsible people. So these things are instilled from the beginning. So you want to look for, I've always looked at the a dojo as part of a team. We're raising the next generation between schools, parents, and sports or a dojo. It's a three-legged table. We've got to support one another. So we have to work together. So most of the time, schools are fine signing off on that letter because they see what we're trying to do. I've only had one school refuse to do it because you know, just, I won't, won't even get into that story. Um, and then parents completely support this whole thing because it monitors them outside the dojo. And uh, it's it's an education. It's not you go to play soccer and that's a sport, and it's great. Get some fit, 
teamwork, all the things you learn in sports, I believe martial arts has much, much more to offer than what sports does. And I, I'm not uh, dissing uh, sports at all, but the martial arts should be, it is deeper. There is more to offer. So, anyway, those are things uh, that uh, folks could look at, look for. Okay, good advice, I think. And yeah, I like your approach that, uh, you know, for onboarding new students, especially the young ones, uh, as a setting of the expectations in advance, it's, uh, you know, it's com there's comfort there, right? There's comfort there for, for, the, for the parents and, and also for the students too, because they know what their expectations are, so. Yeah, and not saying, oh, pretty much you'll be a yellow belt. So if you follow the classes and if you train at home, you'll most likely pass your test in three months. But if you don't, you got another three months to practice and then you can try again. <laughs> yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of lessons to be learned in there too. So yeah. Yeah. Personal responsibility being the greatest of them, I think. But um, yeah. Yeah. So uh, this, this has been great. Um, really, really genuinely enjoyed uh, speaking with you, uh, with you today. Um, you know, we've met a couple of times before, but never had a real conversation like this, especially. So um, yeah. Really appreciated this. Um, um, is there anything that we haven't covered that you would like to share or where I people can find you, that kind of stuff? Oh, um, actually, if anybody would like to visit one time to train with us, they're more than welcome. We have a website, bradjoneskarate.com. The schedule is on there. And uh, we're still operating uh, during COVID. I, was, I kept hearing that we may get shut down again but they haven't announced that yet. Um, so let's hope that doesn't happen. But mm -hmm. so let's, uh, I'm sort of mentally prepared to wait until September before we truly open up properly. But after that, if somebody wants to come and train one night, please. Uh, and again, I, style is irrelevant. Come to a, excuse me, come to a class. Um, we do lots of partner training anyway, reflex training, uh, just to come and train with other people. I'm um, always uh, anxious to have folks come in or if somebody's a head of a style and they want to come and share what they do with us. Yeah, let's talk about it. Come in and do a session on whatever it is you do. Um, uh, I'm in the, uh, the autumn of my career. So uh, I'm trying to expose my uh, membership to as many options as possible um, because I, I have a plan uh, in a couple of years that I want to do an Atlantic circuit. I'm a sailor. So uh, my plan is to cross the Atlantic from uh, Newfoundland to Europe and then to the Canary Islands, then to the Caribbean and back. So it's, it's known as the Atlantic Circuit. It'll take me about a year and uh, I'll be doing that solo. So that is my next big challenge in life is to accomplish this goal. So I'm in, in preparation for that. So before that happens, I'm trying to uh, restructure the dojo so that other instructors can fill in and cover me while I'm adrift. Um, but then I want to come drift, back. But <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully with good wins. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. So oh, that's the plan. Uh, yeah. So, okay, um, great. Yeah. Yeah. I'll, I'll put your dojo um, URL, uh, website URL uh, in the description for, for the, for this video. And, and, and okay. And, um, yeah, again, as, as Sensei said, you know, encourage anyone who's interested to uh, reach out and, and, and uh, you know, maybe visit for a class. Uh, I, I might just find, my, <laughs> find myself up, up your way again at some point soon, too. So hopefully yeah. soon. So. Um, so, yeah, again, thank you very, very much. Uh, really appreciate yeah. speaking with you. And, and uh, you know, it's, it's always insightful when I have these conversations. I always pull something out of it. And, uh, um, you know, I'm sure there, there's there's a number of others that are watching this too that will uh, have the same experience. So, and, well, and thank you very much for doing this, by the way. And this is another thing that COVID has brought on is we, we've slowed down to a point that we can have in depth conversations because when we're all busy, nobody's sitting around watching a podcast because they're too busy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. True. So, yeah. uh, it's uh, it's somewhat of a benefit, I suppose, of the time. So I appreciate uh, you doing this in the first place. Thank you. It's uh, it's a passion project, so we'll uh, we'll see where this leads. But uh, yeah, I'm I'm grateful to be able to do it, and and you know, 
thankful that uh, people are finding value in it. So um, again, really appreciated the discussion and uh, we'll be, we'll be chatting again soon. I'm sure. All right. Thanks so much. All right. Thank you. Yeah.